Hello, and welcome to the IEEE Spectrum Online presentation. From three ring binders to BOM, Lifetime Products' step-by-step -step journey to enterprise PLM. I'm Dexter Johnson, and I'll be moderating this presentation. Before we start our presentation, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. For those of you who want to know if this session will be archived, the answer is yes. It will be archived and will be available for review within about 24 hours. And once the archived webinar is available, a notification email will be sent to all the registrants, and that includes everyone here today. Secondly, we encourage questions, and I hope we have time for several, which we'll take at the end of our presentations. As your questions occur, please type them in the box provided on your computer screen on the left-hand side and hit the Submit button. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions. If you're looking for the PDH certificate code, this will be given in a slide at the end of the presentation. As you look over your screen, you should also see buttons that allow you to enlarge the slides if you so desire. About volume control. If you're listening to the audio portion of this event over your computer and you need to adjust the volume, turn your attention to the speaker icon at the top left of the screen. You may also need to adjust the master volume of your computer system. And at the bottom of the slide, in front of you are a couple of additional widgets that will improve your viewing experience today, including a resource page to the far right with today's presentation. Now I would like to introduce our presenters. First, we have Brady Buchanan, Director of PLM for Lifetime Products. Brady's been with Lifetime Products for the past 23 years. He currently holds the title of Director of PLM and is responsible for all PLM initiatives, including the continuous improvement of enterprise-wide PLM systems, processing, reporting, and integrations. He manages all PLM systems, including PDM Link, Parts Link, Project Link, and Creo. Also, we have with us today Graham Birch. He's the Senior Director of Solution Management at a PTC, and he's responsible for the core windchill. That's change, configuration management, collaboration, project management, search, classification, supplier management, and wheel-treating runtime. Graham started uh, his career in the UK after graduating from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Engineering. He has 30 years of industry experience, and his past roles include applications engineer, implementation consultant, director of R&D for PLM products. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Graham, if you'd like to begin. Yeah, thank you very much, Dexter. So I think that there has never been a more interesting and rewarding time to be an engineer. If you think about it, the last two decades, digital technologies have advanced tremendously and have been incorporated into many of the products that we use today. And in this decade, we will witness the convergence of the digital and the physical with the rapid evolution of a new generation of smart connected products where physical products are augmented with sensors and onboard and cloud-based software to revolutionize the customer experience and spawn whole new business models. The emergence of smart connected products or, and smart manufacturing or industry 4.0, augmented or virtual reality and connected service means that we need to rethink how we approach product development. This new generation of products, you know, while they're exciting and, and rewarding to conceive, you know, they're complex and they'll require an unprecedented level of communication between different disciplines. That's your know, mechanical, electronic, electrical, and software engineers. And in a market that allows only the agile to survive and gain market share, now is the right time to take a fresh look at the ways that digital engineering can be used to improve and modernize the traditional product development process. To borrow a Darwinian phrase, if you would, this is the survival of the digital fittest. So here at PTC, we've introduced the concept of the digital engineering journey. The image of the journey is important because you know, it begins with a starting point, which represents where you are today. 
it has a motivation to change and it has a destination in mind and a series of steps along the way. The digital engineering journey of transformation, we describe it in three bands. There's the understand band, which you know, the focus is really on what you might think of as digital hygiene, you know, using best practices to understand, to organize, to make use of digital data that you most likely already have. The advanced band is where new innovative products are designed for connectivity. They're optimized by making use of data that's harvested from real products in the field. And that information is fed back into the engineering process. And in the outperform band is where the manufacturer has the ability to stay in constant contact with assets in the field through its digital twin and to use powerful analytics to predict future performance and drive not only new generations of products, but maybe to develop entirely new business models. The focus of this session is on the digital product definition, which is in the understand band of the digital engineering journey. Digital product definition describes an outcome where all stakeholders are accessing the most current product information by capturing and coordinating all of the various types of data and processes on an integrated platform. In particular, we'll learn from Brady at Lifetime Products how they modernize their engineering process around the management of builds of material. But before we do that, we'd like to ask you um, a few poll questions. So I'm just going to hand back to Dexter for a moment who will guide us through that process. Okay, great. So um, this is a chance for you to tell us a little bit about what you're doing and um, that way maybe uh, inform us a little bit. Um, what I ask you to do is to choose, use your screen to choose one of the, the options um, and hit the submit button. Please don't chat back your answer because those will not be tabulated. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will sh uh, go over the res Graham and Brady will both discuss the results uh, from these three poll questions. But our first poll question is, how mature do you consider digital product definition to be at your organization? Extremely, very, moderately, slightly, or not at all? So choose one of those options, hit submit, and uh, as I said, the responses will be uh, tabulated and uh, discussed at the end where we will show the uh, results. Okay, the second of our three poll questions. Uh, again, don't chat back your answers. The question is, which projects has your team undergone as a part of your PLM transformation? The first one is BOM structure. The second is parts classification. The third is change management. The fourth is supplier management. The fifth is enterprise collaboration. And the sixth and final option is EBOM to MBOM or SBOM transformation. So choose one of those six um, and uh, we'll give you the results at the end. Let me now go proceed to the third and final uh, poll question, and that is, to what extent is PLM an enterprise initiative at your organization? Again, uh, the options are extremely, very, moderately, slightly, not at all. Choose one of those options and hit the submit uh, question and the submit button and we will tabulate those and give you uh, your responses at the end. And with that, I'm going to now uh, hand it back over to uh, Brady Buchanan. Um, and Brady, if you'd like to begin. Uh, thank you, Dexter. Thank you, Graham, for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to be with you guys today to share Lifetime's PLM journey.
Brady, oh. are, you, are you there? I, apo- I apologize. I was on mute. I apologize. Uh, thank you, Graham and Dexter. I'm excited to be with you here today and share Lifetime's PLM journey. The goal of this presentation is to give a high-level overview of our journey over the last 10-plus years. I feel that it's important for everybody on this call to understand that we attack our PLM vision one step at a time. Always careful to improve the system in an innovative and scalable manner. To take the whole organization into consideration, not one person or team. It's a team effort, but we, prepare, but we are prepared to deal with skeptics, as you should be too. It's good news that eventually they will fall into line with every successful project that you do. At least that's what we've seen here. Um, we will have a Q&A session, as Dexter mentioned at the end of this presentation. Um, the goal there is to answer any questions that you might have. I would encourage everybody to participate in that. Uh, I'm a big believer in collaboration between different industries and different businesses, and this is a great forum. Uh, if you have any other questions for me after this conference that you don't get answered or would like to ask me, you can more than welcome to contact me at bbuchanan at lifetime.com if you have any of those additional questions. First, I would like to introduce, introduce Lifetime products. I started with Lifetime products in May of 1994. Lifetime products is a privately held company located in northern Utah. We sell our products in over 100 countries and wholly own manufacturing facilities in Clearfield, Utah, Shaman, China, and we're currently constructing a facility in Mascot, Tennessee. In addition to our manufacturing facilities, we have distribution facilities in Columbus, Ohio, Kansas City, Missouri, and Monterey, Mexico. We've come a long way since our beginning. It all started with an idea in a garage in Riverdale, Utah. As a dedicated father and a fan of basketball, our founder simply wanted to build a, bas- a better basketball hoop for his family. He couldn't find any in the market. His passion for innovation quickly expanded behind, beyond this initial project, and he created a company in 1986 called Lifetime Products. Lifetime began by manufacturing basketball systems and inventing what we call the quick adjust. It was built it was built to adjust basketball system using just a broom handle. It was the first basketball hoop home, homeowners could raise and lower a basketball system quickly. The invention became the standard for our founder's home and eventually the world. Our innovation continued. We invented friction weld basketball poles that allowed our, assist, our poles to be broken into three sections so we could package everything in one box. We invented blow molded bases that allowed easy mobility of our basketball systems around your yard and driveway. We invented blow molded polyethylene tabletops, which started with a folding picnic table and quickly grew into folding utility tables. To understand the impact that's had on our on our country and the world, try to find a wooden particle board tabletop now. You don't see them in churches, airports, the conference centers. Polyethylene tables have changed the market. We invented blow molded polyethylene folding and stacking chairs. We introduced beautiful blow molded storage sheds, introduced high quality, long lasting residential playground products, introduced blow molded kayaks and paddle boards, and just recently introduced the largest blow molded canoe in the United States at over 13 feet. Our core products, our core competencies reside in blow molding and metal. We, are, we operate a very vertically integrated company. We manage the process from master coil coming in on rail cars and raw resin coming in on rail cars to the finished product. It's the same whether you're in Clearfield, whether you're in China, or whether you're going to be standing in Mascot, Tennessee in the future. All manufacturing facilities are vertically integrated. We focus on a commitment to innovation, tight control of cost, and quality. The journey, our PLM journey, let's get into the meat of the project, the meat of the presentation here. This journey really started for us in around 2005. Lifetime was growing very quickly. We were creating a lot of new product data and designs. 
we found that there were some pretty serious issues that we needed to resolve in order to continue growing profitably and producing high-end quality products. Some of the issues we identified, these were just the ones in front of us, more, more came to us as we progressed down this path. Limited access to drawings, product, able, product data, labels, graphics, and testing information. Drawings were located in three ring binders in the R&D department. All of our project data was located in three ring binders in the R&D department. Images of backboard graphics, labels, stickers, et cetera, were located on personal hard drives. Couldn't get to this without calling somebody. Teams in production, manufacturing, receiving quality needed this information, but they weren't able to get it. This was before cell phones were, were big and affordable. Change management was paper-based, sitting in filing cabinets. Product data changes led to 45-plus person meetings. We had to rely on smart part numbers, memorization, in order to find product data. Stale and uncontrolled product data piled up throughout our company. Engineers were spending too much time managing data instead of designing innovative products. And 16 different databases stored our product data. There was no one source data. We had to understand where the data existed and go try to find it. This is a quote that I try to be try to communicate whenever I can uh, around lifetime and outside of lifetime, which is let's be as innovative with our processes as we are with our products. It is very important for us to constantly improve our processes in order to keep up with our products. Our processes have to be flexible and nimble. You, we, I, I pride myself on the fact that we. I feel like we've built a system where you could add any product category into our, into our system, and we'd be able to manage it. Lifetime Products has always been driven, has always driven their growth on innovative products, and we needed to put the same effort in developing innovative processes. This is how this journey started. One of the first steps we made was we focused on CAD, dad, CAD data management. We had a few problems. Engineering data was not available outside of engineering, aside from hard copy drawings stored in binders. We were a fairly small company back then, but we were still spread over four or five buildings in this industrial park that, that we call home now today. In order for employees to get a drawing, they would have to leave their workstation, in some cases leave their building, get in their car, drive, download a, a photocopy a drawing, put the original back in the book, and head back to their workstation. This is a tremendous waste of time, and it allowed for out-of-date, stale information to be sitting on our production floor, sometimes resulting in quality defects. And to make things worse, engineering time was spent managing three-ring binders instead of working on new innovations. It's a lot of money and a lot of talent photocopying stuff and putting them in a three-ring binder and removing the old ones. So what did we do? Well, the first step in this, we decided to move to Intralink. It was a PTC product um, as a Pro-E data management solution. Pro-E, of course, predecessor to what they call Creo now. We went from hundreds of directories to a single database. Visualization to non-engineers was now possible. We now had revision control on CAD data and release procedures, including electronic sign-off. So we immediately had a method for anybody in the company from a computer on the network to access a drawing, print that drawing. It's a huge step. Not only that, I want to make sure we talk about revision control and sign-off. Also, two things we didn't have before. You could go change it. An engineer could go change a drawing anytime they wanted, go put it in a book. There was no communication, no digital trail. It was a fantastic first step for our company. The next thing we focused on was new product realization. At being a company that focuses so much on, on innovation, we were constantly producing new products. 
Project data was not available outside of engineering aside from a hard copy stored in a three ring binder. All right, same story with the drawings. The enterprise was not engaged with the product development cycle. They relied on the engineer to manage the project. We were walking down the ISO certification path and those requirements required documented processes, standardized documented processes that were being followed by any and all people performing that process. Successful audits were dependent on these individuals that were being audited. And we had five project managers, i.e. five R&D designers that were doing five different, following five different processes. We recognized the need for process control beyond IntraLink. So we migrated from IntraLink to PDM Link 7.0. Well, it's a long time ago. We implemented PDM Link with Project Link. We standardized with project templates. So even though we had PDM Link, we were only using the, the Project Link um, part of PDM Link. We updated and created additional templates as our product lines grew. Currently, we manage 19 active templates over nine distinctly different categories, including product realization, so new product categories, tooling, manufacturing, and even IT. There are currently uh, over 130 new product projects running. Over half of those projects have new technology. We manage all these projects with four project managers. How do we do that? There's no way that one project manager can manage a quarter of those projects. Well, part of the power of this software is we were able to empower the people and the process. Responsibilities were spread throughout the organization. The whole organization was now engaged in the standardized process, and all of the pressure and the work didn't fall on engineering shoulders. At this point, we're really starting to gain traction. Most of the organization is starting to see the benefits of a controlled and standardized PLM system. Next step we made. We have PDM link. We're not using it. We're just using project link. But we decided we need to use this. We have PDM link that gave us the ability to create and manage engineering bill materials. Currently, at this point, our e-bombs will be delivered to a configuration management department, either in an email or an Excel spreadsheet. That information was taken from the Excel spreadsheet or an email and entered into our ERP system um, as an M-bomb. So we took the e-bomb, we added all the packs, the materials, the colors, and we made an M-bomb. This inherently caused issues. We missed stuff. We put the wrong quantities in. There's a number of issues that we made. So we decided that PDM Link controlled system was the right direction to go. We upgraded to PDM Link 8.0. By doing this, our engineers were able to build their eBOM directly from their CAD, significant time savings. eBOM was stored in the design view inside of PDM Link. Configuration, our configuration management team converted the EBOM into an MBOM in the design view. We reduced data entry errors by a configuration management team, and the BOM was set to a release date. The EBOM or MBOM could not be changed unless configuration management was notified. Again, huge step. A lot of work, huge step. Next thing we did is we wanted to be able to manage the E-bomb and the M-bomb individually. Because we were converting the E-bomb into an M-bomb, the E-bomb no longer existed in PDM link. We decided the best course of action would be add additional, add an additional view to PDM link. So this project consisted of converting everything in design view back to E-bombs creating an additional view, which we called the manufacturing view, and we created M-bombs for every product that we made. In addition to the bombs, we introduced document association through WT part use inside of Windchill. Design view had all the WT parts, and into those WT parts, we had CAD and drawings associated. And the manufacturing view had all the WT parts for the manufacturing version, and had all the drawings associated to that. 
now we were gaining steam. Every WT part that we had in our system was managed in our PLM system. At this point, we turned our attention to change management. We were doing such a fantastic job of managing all of our WT parts, managing the product structure, how they work together, but our change management system was outside. It was a paper-based system, and it was outside of our PLM system, which means things were changing, and people that were using our PLM system couldn't see that there was a pending change or a history. Product change meetings were time-consuming. They required a physical meeting. Limited process standardization was all over the place. Everybody did it differently. Changes were not associated to our product data. Changes were happening in weekly batches, which means if you had to get something done before next Wednesday, somebody had to personally walk a document around the whole organization. Two hour plus long meetings with over 45, 45 plus attendees. Many sitting the full two hours just to see the last change request because that was the one that they needed to approve. Approval required a physical signature, which means they had to be there or the change would not happen. Hard copies were stored in file cabinets. If you wanted to see the history, if you wanted to see somebody's signature, if you wanted to see any notes, you had to go search through a filing cabinet. Well, how do we address this? First thing we did is we implemented a CM2-like change management system for EBOM and MBOM within inside PDM Link. The functionality already existed inside of PDM Link. We used it to standardize our change management processes. We configured and developed out-of-the-box workflows to automate the change management process. Change management system was at now executing electronically. Digital signatures can now be completed by the owner at their workstation on their schedule. Changes are now associated directly to the affected data. Changes now could happen in real time instead of waiting a week at a time to be implemented. Oh, man, this is moving on. We're moving in the right direction. We now have our E-bombs. We now have our M-bombs. We're now managing change. I can go in and I can see a little pretty triangle next to any part that that's changing, has a change pending on it. I can click on that icon. I can see history. I know what's changed. I know when they changed. I know who approved them, and I know the notes. We kept growing. And as we grew, we added multiple manufacturing facilities in Utah, and we were adding additional manufacturing in, in China when more opportunities were identified. Multiple manufacturing locations needed unique M-bombs. Our customers needed more information from the M-BOM. They needed describing documents for more than just engineering parts. Our marketing, sales, and engineering departments were spending a considerable amount of time gathering this information for our customers in manufacturing. Examples of this is, what does a label look like? What does a sticker look like? Am I putting the right label on this? Um, incoming receiving inspection. When they were receiving boxes or were receiving printed printed materials, they want to be able to see a visual representation to make sure they're receiving the right product. None of this was available without contacting somebody. How did we address this issue? Well, we created multiple views inside of PDM Link. We left Design View the way it is. Design View is a pure e-bomb. Regardless of where your product's being made, your e-bomb should be consistent. Your M-bomb is what should be modified based on where you're manufacturing your product and how you're manufacturing your product. Here at Lifetime today, we currently maintain 10 unique manufacturing sites, including partner sites. We have certain partners that we invite inside of our PLM system that we create bill materials for. Their bill materials are different because they're not as vertically integrated as we are. We need to be sensitive to that. We introduced document association to WT part use. We were now associating CAD, PDF, and office documents to our WT parts inside of PDM Link. We associated describing documents in all parts of the MBOM, labels, stickers, testing, label placement, 
packaging configurations. We even showed shipping how to load a truck and how to stack in a warehouse. All this information was very important. We were designing product to be stacked a certain height, but we weren't communicating to the people who were stacking that product in a warehouse. This helped resolve that issue. This was also the point when Lifetime implemented effectivity on a WT part level inside a PDM link. Effectivity simply meaning that this product based on from this date range, from this start date to this start date is what we should be using if we're gonna make this product. That effectivity date was on based on every single part all the way up to our end product that we shipped to our customer. By implementing the effectivity schema, I can go to any date in the last 10 years and I can tell you what went on the box on that day just out of my PLM system. At this point, we also integrated our China operations. From this point on, everywhere in our organization, regardless of what country, what state you're in, you follow the exact same process as everybody else. You use the same solutions, you use the same hardware, you use the same software. All these manufacturing views are providing great information and it allowed our customers to find information themselves. Our marketing, sales, and engineering departments were much more efficient now. Our configuration management team, however, was struggling to keep up with our bill of materials in PDM link and in our ERP system. M bombs were being created in PDM link and then recreated in our ERP system. Duplicate entry was riddled with errors that ultimately caused quality issues on the shop floor. It doubled the work and it affected our time to market. This is something we needed to address. We decided to integrate our PDM link system with our ERP system. Real-time updates without the risk of error. All parts created, all parts were created and managed in PDM link and pushed to our ERP system. This was the final step in eliminating or integrating all of our external product related databases. PDM link was now the one source data for all of our PLM data. As our products matured and our product lines grew, so did the parts and end items that we were managing. In the beginning, Lifetime, like most companies, believed that creating smart part numbers was a great solution. That was before we had these powerful databases to manage our data. Smart part numbers were no longer needed. I was probably the only person at Lifetime that believed that, but no longer. We made progress on that. The problems that we were facing is it was very difficult for us to search for product data. It was easier, our engineers found it easier to create a whole new part than it was to find a part that they could use. So they would create all new CAD, they would create all new drawings, they would create all new part numbers just so they could get through their process faster. That's a problem. In preparing for this project, we actually did a study, we used one of our engineers and we looked at rivets. We used rivets across our tables and our chair products. And we found that we had five rivets that were exactly the same or could be exactly the same from three different suppliers. Why they didn't tell us the parts were similar, I don't know. But we, identified a great deal of parts that could be used interchangeably that allowed us to increase volume and decrease inventory. Other problems we were having is smart part numbers weren't scalable enough for our company. Smart part numbers required detailed training. What did we do? Well, we implemented a part naming standard across the organization. We created and implemented classification schemas we focused on part reuse, which increased. We improved searching, and we eliminated smart part numbers. All of our part numbers are assigned by PDM link at creation. No more smart part numbers. Um, the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this last this last step, um, a little bit more detail about how we accomplished this. This is parts classification. Uh, many people didn't really see the vision of why we would want to classify parts. Many people said, just classify your part in the, in the name of it. 
or classify your part, tell me what the part is in your part number or tell me what the part is in your description. Uh, well, that obvious that all uh, uh, for us created a lot of different names for our parts, different abbreviations, different acronyms, um, and these these complex documents on how to understand them and how to read them. We felt like classification. We felt like building this information and the attributes that are associated to a part made a lot more sense for us. It was something that we could mine against. It was something we could report on. Uh, it was something that we could use for more than just a description of a part. The first thing we did, we determined our end goal. Why do we want to classify parts? What does it mean to classify a part? These are obviously very different depending on your organization. We focused on part reuse and searching for both end items which is the parts that we deliver to our end consumers and parts. We determined that classifying a part or end item started with identifying all of the attributes that we felt we needed to describe that part or end item. Again, different by organization. Next thing we did is we did our hard we did our homework. We went to the assort we went to a lot of different websites to learn about how different industries were classifying their products. What Amazon does every single day is classification, how you drill down to a product. There's a lot of hardware companies that have very good classification systems built right into their uh, websites. We learned from them. We then interviewed our customers to understand what was important to them. Our customers have to feel like they're part of the solution. Um, and the only way it's going to be successful is that they are involved with the solution. That's typically the only way they're going to use it. So to give you an example, a bolt. We started with a bolt, and we identified the attributes that we felt like were critical to identifying what that bolt was and how it can be used. So just to give you a list of the attributes, classification attributes, we identified diameter, finish, braid, head style, length, thread pitch, and thread style. Those are the classification attributes that we felt like we needed to say what this part is. Next thing we did is we focused on end items. We felt like classifying our end items, the products that were going to our end consumers, was just as important as the parts going into them. So an example on a basketball system, the classification attributes, marketing origin, Adjustment type, backboard size, backboard type, base type, pole sections. How many pole sections? One piece pole, three piece pole. Pole size, rim type, and warranty. Those, that was the information that our customers were always looking for when they wanted to identify a basketball system. So a certain base. I want to see everything with this type of a base or this type of a backboard. Or show me everything that has a 10-year warranty. Or show me everything that has this base or this base or this base. And there was... There was a lot of you can it's 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 a multi level. So I can say with this space or this space, but it has to be this backboard or this backboard. It was a really powerful tool that we we had in Parslink and um we built the the functionality into that. Next thing we did is we created a proposal. So our proposal was that we create a standard naming convention. Next part of our proposal was that we wanted to eliminate all smart part numbers for both parts and end items. Next step, we wanted to break the implementation down by phases. The first phase, we want to focus on end items. Second phase, hardware. Third phase, 2B, and et cetera. We started by creating a naming convention, and we eliminated smart part numbers. We started with our end items that we were willing to, that we were selling to our customers. This was the product that we internally knew best. I mean, we had people that understood nuts and bolts and tubes, but we understood what we were producing because it was our product. The other great thing about this is that we felt like it had the biggest positive in impact to the most individuals in the, com in the company. Um, by giving our customers the ability to search for our end items, they saw the power in this tool, which gave us traction and leverage to move into our WT parts, hardware, tubing, 
that type of thing. The next step we did, we got our teams in sync. Our team, my team can provide the manpower. However, the organization needs to understand and support the direction. There will always be skeptics, but I assure you they will fade away if you deliver a low impact, powerful tool. By starting with end items, we were able to get sales and marketing engaged quickly. This provided significant traction to the project. Last step, we drove the project. In our organization, we personally need to drive this project, as most of the projects you've seen in this presentation. We have to work very closely within the organization to assure that they stay engaged and they see the vision and they're part of the vision. We need to listen. We need to adapt to their needs, and it requires change. There's scope creep and there's rework. Many times we'll get involved, we'll well down a road, somebody changes their mind, we have to go back and rework everything we've done. It's happened more times than I can count, but us showing our customers that we're listening and we're willing to do the work has made all the difference in the world. Next. This is probably my most important comment that I would make and I have been making for, for quite a long time. TDM link, i.e. PLM, is, not an inter, is, is an enterprise tool. It is not an R&D tool. In many companies, PLM, uh, Windchill, is focused inside of the R&D department. That's it. Um, from my point of view, PLM is a highly valuable tool that can make your whole organization much more efficient. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, we've kind of talked about the, the projects that we've, we went down our little path and what types of departments use that within the organization. This is just a list of few. Engineering, testing, manufacturing, legal, suppliers, scheduling. Configuration management, planning, tooling, accounting, purchasing, change management, sales, logistics, marketing, customer service. All of these departments plus more and the same here, here locally or globally use our tools and they all use it the same way. It's been extremely powerful and it allows our customers to be engaged with our everyday process. Transformation does not need to be an overhaul. I've, I've mentioned this a few times in this presentation where this can all be done in small chunks. You do not have to understand where you're going to be in 10 years in order to make a difference today. All of our projects are scoped for a maximum of three months. Parts classification, for example, the last project we talked about, required more than three months to complete. We just broke the project as a whole down into smaller phases. First phase, naming standard. We just developed it. We just identified it, worked with our customers. Second phase, we renamed all of our parts in our organization in every single company, in every single view. Next step, we created our classification schema. Next step, class classified all of our end items. Step after that, we classified all of our hardware, et cetera. You can make a difference taking smaller bites. And the impact, if you fail, is much smaller. You don't need an army to implement change. Our PLM department consists of myself, two windshield business admins, and one CAD admin. It takes a little longer, but we can make a big impact. Um, in, in, in the past, back in 2005 where we started, it was even less than four. But today, that's what drives this process for people. The next big thing that's made a difference is we have worked hard to be innovative without having to manage customizations to our software. We use tools in, included in Windchill to configure the software, such as workflows and adding attributes. However, we have never customized our PDM Link software. We do all of our own upgrades 
and this makes this process extremely easier. So we do have reporting, we do have integrations, but as far as the code of windshield, we don't touch, never have. Our best practices, I want to take a little time to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've learned along the way. Number one, strong executive leadership is required. No ands, ifs, or buts about this. They don't have to lead the project, but they have to support you. Number two, it's important that it, it's important to be good at good business process design. Good products and good processes. Dedicated resources for business process design. Drive the process and the method together. Don't have processes in a binder sitting on a shelf. Embed the process in the method. Next, train on the process, not on the tool. Training on the tool creates many methods. Training on the process drives the objective and one method. Try and build a robust training team. Most of the time this requires a train the trainer mentality as PLM departments don't have the resources to train the whole organization. Use a commonly developed process as a starting point. Study how the industry handles PLM. Partner with a company that is part of that community. Make changes, adapt as needed, and most importantly, fail fast, fail cheap. That's one of my favorite lean terms I've, I learned when reading books, some lean books. The only reason that I do stuff like today, which you probably tell I'm a little nervous, is that it's important that we as as regardless of our industry, as PLM innovators, work together to improve all of our systems as a whole. And I'd like to tell you that I'm always here to help anybody who feels like they have questions or a vision. And I've, I've had the opportunity to work with some fantastic companies that have done the same for me. Next, implementation as much as a bit, is as much of a business transformation that is a technology installation. Processes may need to change in order to be automated. Everybody's seen the resistance to changing processes and, of course, enterprise thinking. Whenever we're walking down a path of business transformation, we need to take the business as a whole into consideration. Automation capability drives a process mentality. There's great many people in this world that hate following an electronic process because it forces them to do the process. However, being forced to follow a process drives process improvement. If they are forced to follow a process, it allows us to build their recommendations, their improvement back into the process where it helps the whole organization. Critical. Last one. Integration with ERP is vital. Keeping the data accurate in two systems is impossible manually. We draw a clear line between ERP data and PLM data. The data that's located in our PLM system is one source data and it is PLM data. That does not mean that our ERP system does not use that data. There's other systems that use that data. What, what's important to understand is that it's one source. PLM, our PLM processes, is the system that owns that data. So, wrapping up, three more slides. The value of enterprise PLM from our standpoint, some of the things that we've, we've, we feel like we've gained the most value. Change management efficiency, earlier planning cycles, enterprise integration, faster time to market, improved quality, increased focus on process, in particular standard work, less design rework, more time for innovation, new growth capabilities, new product uh, uh, improvements, project management efficiency, real-time virtual access to data, reduced waste, scrap, rework, and scalability. It's a lot of words and we hear them all the time, but I'm telling you that every single one of those we've experienced because of the process that we've built 
starting back in 2005. The tangible side. So we mentioned a few of these throughout the, the, the presentation, but I just want to draw your attention to five of them. We went from 16 product-related databases to one, which is WindChill. We went from 45-plus person meetings to an electronic change management system. 400-plus PLM users standardized globally, 50-plus CAD users, enterprise collaboration across 15 teams. When I say teams, I mean departments. Almost every part of our organization is involved in our PLM system. Really quick, the tips to driving this change, take small steps, do it the right way, don't ignore something because it seems hard, don't be afraid to fail, collaborate, it's critical, give relationships the attention they need, and make sure you get executive buy-in. Thanks for the time to be to taking part in this presentation. I appreciate it. I'm available for questions at the end. And I will now turn the time back over to Graham. Thank you, Brady. I really like the fact that your journey wasn't like one giant stride, you know, like an expensive big bang, but it was made up of a series of smaller steps with you know, clear value attainment along the way. So earlier in the session, we asked some poll questions. So let's just quickly review the results of the, the poll. So how mature do you consider your digital product definition to be at your organization. Um, so only a few people think they're uh, you know, really, really mature, and it looks like we're all on the journey. So what projects has your team undergone as a part of your PLM transformation? Um, bomb structure looks like a popular project, about 40%. Um, followed by enterprise collaboration and change management quickly afterwards. And then finally, to what extent is PLM an enterprise initiative at your organization? Um, seems like uh, most people are in the kind of the very category, but I'm, I'm taking from that that most people or most organizations regard it as uh, you know, largely an ent engineering enterprise, so, sorry, an engineering initiative rather than enterprise initiative. So thank you for that. Um, so the BOM is the foundation of the digital product definition. And three principles that, that I learned from Brady's experience is that you know, an effective BOM that's complete and correct is managed in one place in the PLM system. And it integrates with all product data so that it can be easily shared to downstream functions such as supply chain, procurement, and ERP. Now, secondly, um, I learned that the transformation of the bond process can be step by step. Right? It doesn't have to be a big bang, expensive, long-term overhaul. And then thirdly, that an undertaking such as this really should be treated as a, an enterprise initiative. Well, they say that a journey begins with the smallest steps, and often identifying that step can be a little daunting. And so you know, what I take away from the experience at Lifetime is that it's more important to start the journey than it is to agonize over what's the exact optimal first step. So there could be different starting points depending on where you are in your own journey of transformation. You know, for some, it could be the bomb structure. But for others, it could be change management or part classification you know, supplier management or enterprise collaboration. But the key seems to be to pick a fight, win it, recognize the value, and then move on to the next. I'd like to bring to your attention our um, upcoming PTC virtual conference. Uh, this is an online event, so um, Invitations will be going out in the next week or two, so keep your eyes peeled. Uh, this is going to be a terrific event. We'll have 10 live breakout sessions with subject matter experts on a variety of different topics. You can join as many sessions as you like. Uh, we'll have PTC product and partner booths, virtual booths, 
and a peer networking lounge where you can chat with uh, your peers from other companies. So this is a fantastic event. Uh, we hope you'll join us. Uh, it's not an event that, uh, that you'd want to miss. And with that, I think we just have a few minutes left to take any questions. So okay, maybe Dexter, great. if you could help us through that question process. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody gets the PDH code. I'm putting that out there now. Um, we have a lot of questions, obviously, for Brady. Um, so um, first question I have for you here, Brady, is uh, love the, I guess, is it sale fast or sell fast, uh, sale. sale fast, sale, sale cheap mantra. Sale um, how do you get users to buy into that philosophy? And users are often resistant to changes. What techniques did you find helpful to get users, management, and customers buy into the rapid change mantra? Uh, it's a great question. Um, a lot of that uh, fail fast, fail cheap, the lean initiative was driven from our upper management, from our executive management. And we just took that and utilized that to our benefit. Um, the biggest way that we, we, we got our, our customers to, to accept this change is we did it in small chunks. So, I mean, even, even though I brought this down in a few chunks today, um, it's important to understand that there was a lot of little chunks in between those. Um, and we did it to where the small was, the change was so small, in some cases a little bit bigger, that it didn't have such a huge impact. I talked a little bit about have a low impact, but have a, a large, a large, a larger impact in the performance of their job. So that's kind of how we focus our attention um, there. That's we we um, allowed our customers to be involved with the process. And a lot of the fail fast, fail cheap was in my department and with the support of, of my manager um, allowing us to make those changes um, and not being afraid to fail. So I hope that answered a little bit of that question. Yeah, okay. A uh, couple more for you, uh, Brady. Regarding classification, are you using PartsLink? And do your customers perform the classification activities, or do you have a classification team? Uh, great question. So, yes, we are using PartsLink. Um, our customers are the ones that classify the parts. My department is the one that heads up building the classification schema. So we work with what we call our business owners. So if it's, in, if it's a basketball part we meet with, and it's an engineering basketball part, we meet with an engineering team for basketball to define what that classification scheme is going to be. If it's a marketing part, we meet with marketing. So we manage the schema. Our customers, the people that are creating the parts, are the ones that actually fill out the classification for each individual part. And then we use our configuration department to audit it to make sure that they're, they're actually filling it out. Okay. Um, another question here just came in. Uh, did you use multiple CAD tools before moving to Windchill? Yep. We used uh, AutoCAD and we used um, ProE. We standardized on ProE, now Creo, um, and we only use AutoCAD for floor layouts. So AutoCAD still exists inside of our company, but it's a limited role. It's not to be used to um, design our product. Okay. And another question about Windchill. How, how big of a Windchill support team staff did you have during this transition? And did you do this primarily with in-house resources or utilize a partner? Oh, great question. So four people, I would say that in general, three to four people we've done this whole transition with. Uh, this is, you know, Lifetime works very closely. We have, we're tight-knit teams. You know, we have IT as support. We have other people as support. But the core team is three to four people. Um, we do this ourselves. We do it all in-house. So one of the, I think one of the things that has really helped us be successful, we do not use PTC, 
support, I mean, not support other than, you know, technical support. We don't use our global services. We don't use any other partners. Our philosophy is we need to understand the nuts and bolts of this. We need to understand what's going on under, under the hood in order for us to fully take advantage of this in the very end. Uh, we want to be in control of our own destiny. So we do all of our own upgrades. We do all of our own integrations. We do everything ourselves. And if there's something that we can't do, we develop that talent in-house. Okay, great. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, do you deal with integrating electronic hardware, software, and mechanical hardware? Uh, just curious if there's been any chance to integrate across multiple CAD development systems. So, no. We don't have, I mean, I guess, I, I don't know if he's, if he's referring to electronic software mechanicals inside of our product or just in general. Um, we have not integrated across multiple CAD or development systems. Um, we're, we're unique in a way where we don't grow a lot through acquisition. There's, I know there's a lot of companies on the phone call now that grow a lot through acquisition. A few times that we have grown through acquisition, we've completely assimilated them into our system. We don't run multiple systems inside of Lifetime. So if you want to design a product, you're going to use Creo. If you want to manage a product, a new product uh, project, you're going to use Project Link. Uh, if you want to, you know, create a, a part, you're going to use a PDM link to do that. So we, we feel like really what allows us to be scalable and flexible and nimble by, by standardizing on one system, even though that sometimes it's been very painful. Okay. Um, we just, if, if you have a short response, I think we can get one more question in. And so what's next for Lifetime and what's your next step? So our next step that we're working on right now, which is not so much, I mean, it's PLM, but not so much maybe about this one is, is machine connectivity. We are in the process of connecting all of our machines to our network. We want to know what our machines are making, how are they're making them, um, OEE, there's, you know, metrics. We want alerts. We want all sorts of information off of our machines. And right now our machines are tube mills, roll forms, blow molding machines, punching machines, minster machines, all the stuff that we have on this floor, on our floor across the world, we want to know what it's doing, how it's performing. So that's what we're doing right now, machine connectivity. We're connecting all of our machines to our network. Okay, great. Thank you, Brady. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now out of time, and as I indicated earlier, this session will be archived in about 24 hours. Um, and once the archived webinar is available, a notification email will be sent to all the registrants. I'd like to thank Graham and Brady for making this such an informative hour. Our sponsor and thank you, our audience, for participating in today's session. And we hope you found today's webcast valuable and will return for future IEEE Spectrum webcasts. Thank you. Thank you.